All right, we're recording now um, in OBS, not in Zoom. And welcome, uh, Sasar, Christopher, what's happening? Welcome everybody else on the Discord or just happening by stumbling up across this video. We are back for more Totality and Infinity, Emmanuel Levinas. Um, we hopefully will finish out the first chapter or section uh this weekend Sasar and i met up at the tempe public library and read the first two sub subsections <laughs> uh and then uh and today hopefully we'll finish the following three sub subsections of the first section or no the first subsection of the first section because the way this book is laid out is goofy because phenomenologists like to have fun with their formatting, apparently. I don't know. I'm not quite sure exactly why everything is set up weird. Um, but we've had a couple days to ruminate on our, on our initial reading. Um, Christopher, you said you had watched our first session. Mm -hmm. um, how was that? I know the quality was really bad, so I didn't watch it back because it was just... It was bad, but did you get, did you, I don't know, did you enjoy it? I did. It was nice to kind of watch two other people dive into it. I like the fact that you guys were in person too, just something different, but it was just good to see because it's like, okay, I'm not alone in some of the alienness of Levinas. Yeah. And then, I think the main thing that I just liked is just hearing it out loud. I started listening to it on like Speechify, which mm -hmm. is interesting, but having that like little bit of like break where you guys interpret and kind of like jive off one another, I think is good too. Cause you can kind of see like similar trains of thoughts or a different interpretation and no, I thought it was cool. Uh, the quality seemed pretty good to me, but my standards are pretty low. Well, that's that's how we get down here at uh, at Theory Underground. We don't care too much about all that stuff, but it does make a difference. Um, and we got the nice microphones today. Yeah, we got the, we got the good audio today. Um, hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, you you said uh, after the fact you were like having the other in quotes present in the room kind of like uh challenged you to up your game as far as like grappling with the text yeah and what people couldn't see in that video was the study rooms are set up really weird there where there's this window to the other study room so there's there was like these people probably just trying to get some work done on their laptops and they're over here just listening to me and Nance read out loud <laughs> as as loud as we could for the microphone <laughs> for, for the, the audio microphone. Yeah. yeah. And we probably maybe we probably like uh vibe them out a little bit too hard or something. I don't know. They didn't want to say anything. But it was it was weird to even have like <laughs> to know that there's like a um unsolicited audience that was probably hearing what we had to read out um so even that kind of like i don't know brought something different to it um but yeah it's 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 always going to make a difference when something's in person and not just on a computer um i don't know if I don't know if that's a big revelation for anyone. I think everyone can uh, can relate to that. Here's the deal, man. I I think it is because like, so when I when I had that dawning realization, we were on the metro in New Jersey on our way back. Um, I can't remember where the hell we were. It was late at night. It was like three in the morning, and we were taking the train, and I was reading McLuhan. So I was, I'm reading McLuhan out loud on the subway train. Um, and I started off and I was very timid. Like we were recording. We wanted to do a exegetical reading and had fallen asleep. 
uh dave was we were loopy it was so late at night or so early in the morning we were just kind of out of it and instead of doing an exegetical reading session i just like i i read for like two hours on the train and at first i was very timid and i was unsure but then by the end of it i was kind of boisterous and like overbearing kind of over, like filling this this metro cabin with my voice and i'm reading marshall McLuhan. Um, and it was weird, but I do think the way people, like the way people treat reading, the way people think about reading and study and research or whatever, whatever it is that we do, cause it's not just reading. Like there is a difference between reading. Like I read science fiction books and I, the way I read science fiction is different from the way I read theory and philosophy. Um, and I think people take reading for granted. Um, and doing shit like this, calling, calling attention to just like the modality of, of what, not even the modality, like what it is you're doing in the first place. I think it's lost on a lot of people. And I think when, when we go out and we do this shit, I think we are out ahead of it. Um, and I think it's, I think it's amazing. Like the, the fact that you, you got that and that you were, that you articulated it. I was like, fuck yeah, he gets it. Like, I don't think, uh, I don't think other people would get that. Cause I don't think people are confronted with that. Like how often do we read in, with others anyway? I don't, maybe, maybe it's school. I don't know. It's been a long time since I've been in school, but I imagine even those types of like study sessions or whatever are different from what we were doing in the library and what we're doing here. Um, and it's all, yeah, it's all new. It's all experimental as far as using these platforms and shit is concerned. Uh, I know there's other reading groups online, but I, I think, I don't know. I'm, I'm convinced what we're doing here is different. Um, so anyway, um, before we go into to section to sub subsection three um should we do like a little a little overview or a little commentary on the first two sections cool. you want to go first christopher um i think the main thing for me that picked up is still seeing like I read somewhere else that like his argument is kind of like a wave and I'm just noticing that like phenomenologist in him where it's like, he'll, he'll present something or like, let's say he talks about the individual. I forget the word he uses for it. Uh, the I S P E I T Y. What is that? Ips 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 yeah. Yeah. So he keeps like using that and, uh, auto, um, uh, autochronosis or whatever which is like the individual and you'll kind of be like okay i i think i get what he's going with that and then he'll just keep bringing it back and i like kind of the elliptical nature of it because it's such a foreign like water like the preface for example when i like read it the first time i was like i have no idea what this guy is talking about like it just like blasts you out of nowhere and i just feel like he's kind of laying the framework for it but if you feel lost still which i still have that sense it's okay because he's coming back to it if that makes sense and i, I like it because i felt like he was just kind of like laying the framework and then he's about to bring up more heidegger to kind of be like this is what i'm responding to you read for example like um what is it metaphysics precedes ontology in the first section and you're like what like what like i just read heidegger and i was like i thought we're here in the world already we have all this uh referential totality and all this stuff and i thought like dasein is primary and it's like now he's kind of throwing that loop where it's like no 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 you're responding to the other person and i think he's just kind of I guess building up for that or planting seeds. That's, that's what I got out of it from what I remember. I spent yesterday reading uh, another text of his, so I'm trying not to like let that color what I remember from the 
what you guys read. So apologies if I danced around the topic. No, I think I think that was good. The uh, Levinas thought is like a wave crashing against the beach. Um, I like that, it, and it is very iterative and not like not to say that disparagingly. I know that I guess could be thought of as like a I don't know, like a shitty thing to say about someone's work, but no, like it is very like I'm going to walk you up to it, and then we'll kind of take a breath. And then I'm going to walk you up to it. And then we'll kind of step back and catch our breath and collect ourselves. And, and yeah, I, I mean, Heidegger does the same thing, this kind of directionality and this kind of like, let me hold your hand as I take you into this dark forest and kind of let you encounter the lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. Um, yeah, I think I, uh, I, I struggle with some of the words like, Ipsaity and like mm. autocathonic, or I don't even probably saying that wrong. So, sounds good to me. Yeah, like his uh, his lexicon is, and I think I think maybe maybe he's just more playful because he is or he seems to be kind of concerned with humanness itself and like mm. love and spirit and uh, you know, just kind of letting life be celebrated whereas a lot of these other especially german thinkers were very serious and they're like no we're gonna figure this shit out and levinas is like yeah we're gonna figure this shit out but also there's some shit you can't figure out and like that's where we come in i don't know no i was gonna say too real quick oh sorry you you go ahead caesar i i was gonna make a dumb little quip and say i think you created a new term nance autocathonic sounds like a a nick land term actually it, that's yeah well because cathonic is like of the head and auto so i i actually thought about that because i I caught myself thinking autocathonic like would that be like autopoietic anyway that yeah that's a <laughs> That's like language nerd shit that I don't think anyone else is going to be interested in. Um, <sighs> I know we had some questions about desire. Um, and I, actually, those weren't on the, on the video as much. But yeah, like the translation of desire, or not even the translation, but like the fact that he will sometimes capitalize desire, sometimes won't. Um, he does the same thing with other, is there, like, does that matter? Uh, is that still an open question? I, I think I have my, like, my speculation is that he's doing metaphysical desire and then like this lower base desire that gets taken as even like a, like a psychoanalytic type of desire versus like metaphysical desire. But I don't think that's answered in the text, at least yet. I think I'm kind of projecting. Um, but I, and then other than that, like I, I know in these coming sections, he gets explicitly Heideggerian. So I'm excited for that. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, other than that, are we ready to go? Uh, I just want to say the thing that's stayed in my mind from this last, these last uh, beginning sections is um, his idea of bringing up that, uh, that Hegel quote, quotation, um, yes. where he's talking about the eye and the eye and things like that. And I know I, I'm not caught up on Hegel, but I know that there's an idea of something like a does not equal a, or, you know, like there's there's something still like uh, not complete about that. It almost like has to be. So so in a sense, uh, I think Levinas brings up that idea of um, maybe someone like Hegel thinks that you could still put otherness into an equation where there's an equal sign. And if you just do enough algebra on you know the sameness side or the otherness side you can make same and other eventually equal each other um and levinas is basically saying no 
I'm going to say right now, you can never make them equal. Um, and uh, I think that's that's something that's going to be interesting because um, I was also listening to, to Dave's first lecture uh, on this, um, just like the latter half of it. And I think that's kind of what Dave was also taking away from it was was how Levinas was talking about this um basically you can't make same and other exchangeable with each other if we're going to kind of think of it in a economic sense yeah uh, yeah yeah it, they they are so unique to each other that you can never find a mediary a mediary uh like symbol or like um other factor to make them exchangeable you know the way that like money makes things exchangeable. Yeah. Levinas is saying nope, money actually can't, uh, can't can't make this thing equal this thing. They are too unique to each other. They're like one of a kinds. Yeah, I think I I think that like that's why Levinas is I think so important. We, at least from my perspective, like we appear to be approaching a point in history where the that kind of lie of symmetrical exchange has reached like total capture um Ooh. like people talk about the singularity and it's oh it's the last great invention and this and that um and that's like yeah that's cool i my theory is not that we have not that we are going to come up with one final invention but just that all of our all of the space, all of the human space in the world is going to kind of get filled in by techno capital or just capital. Um, and ultimately, capital is just an equal sign. Like, it's just about accumulation and it's just about this equal sign. It's just about this process of ideology that takes one thing and says we can abstract from it some quality or uh, some notion that has to deal directly with a thing and we can do the same to another thing and we can abstract and get to this level where they are equal. And like, that's, that's all capital is. It's not all capitalist, but that's what capital does. And it's very machinic. It's very arithmetic. It's very algebraic, whatever. And then Levinas comes along and, and he's like, dude, the fucking first thing about being a human is that you can never put the equal sign there. You, like it just, you're speaking a different language. And that's the, the, like, that's the hill that he, he chose. Um, and I think a lot of other people find ways of justifying why they give up on that notion. And Levinas always kind of comes back to, no, infinity, people are infinities. The other is this infinity that you can't totalize. Um, and yeah, like, I, I think Levinas is a bitch slap too. <laughs> to this kind of like, well, to the present moment, maybe, I don't know. Um, and yeah, dude, like Hegel, I think maybe the most popular reading of Hegel is just that teleological process of, of like, well, that equals, I mean, you, you basically can do that with that mainstream Hegelian take where, yeah, everything equals everything else because from that point of view, like it is a teleological process and that's not my Hegel, but I, like, I know my Hegel is not the mainstream Hegel. Like I know I jump through hoops and justify a bunch of bullshit. Um, so I like that you're kind of setting that up this battle with dialectics or that, that version of dialectics. We've called it dumb fuck dialectics in the past where it's just a very small brained one plus one always equals two shut up and go back to work. Um, and yeah, I think Levinas is, is a good counter to that. Um, but also I'm a fucking idiot and I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about everything. So, <laughs> but, uh, I, I'm putting my faith in you for right now. Cesar. So, so. <laughs> I'm putting my faith in Levinas via you. Um, so yeah, with that, I, I think, in the interest of getting this done in a timely fashion, I think if we're ready to go, let's go. Um, 
I'll start right here, section three. And we'll do the three, three puff pass. Cool. Section three, transcendence is not negativity. The movement of transcendence is to be distinguished from the negativity by which discontent man refuses the condition in which he is established. Negativity presupposes a being, a, a being established, placed in a site where he is at home, chez soi. It is an economic fact in the etymological sense of this adjective. Labor transforms the world, but is sustained by the world it transforms. The labor that matter resists puts to profit the resistance of materials. The resistance is still within the same. The negator and the negated are posited together, form a system that is a totality. The doctor who missed an engineering career, the poor man who longs for wealth, the patient who suffers, the melancholic who is bored for nothing, oppose their condition while remaining attached to its horizons. The otherwise and the elsewhere they wish still belong to the here below they refuse. I'm just going to highlight this. Um, they remain opposed while remaining attached to their horizons. The otherwise and the elsewhere they wish still belong to the here below they refuse. The desperate person who wills nothingness or eternal life pronounces a total refusal of the here below, but death, for the one bent on suicide and for the believer, remains catastrophic. God always calls us to himself too soon. We want the here below. In the horror of the radical unknown to which death leads is evinced the limit of negativity. This mode of negating while taking refuge in what one negates delineates the same for the eye. The alterity of a world refused is not the alterity of the stranger, but that of the fatherland which welcomes and protects. Metaphysics does not coincide with negativity. And there's that word fatherland. And also this, this negativity um, is interesting from this, looking at it from point of view of dialectics. One may indeed endeavor to deduce the metaphysical alterity from beings that are familiar to us and thus contest its radical character. Is not metaphysical alterity obtained by the superlative expression of perfections whose pale image fills the here below? But the negation of imperfections does not suffice for the conception of this alterity. Precisely, perfection exceeds conception, overflows the concept. It's, it designates distance. The idealization that makes it possible is a passage to the limit, that is, a transcendence, a passage to the absolutely other. The idea of the perfect is an idea of infinity. The perfection designated by this passage to the limit does not remain on the common plane of the yes and the no at which negativity operates. On the contrary, the idea of infinity designates a height and a nobility, a transcendence. The Cartesian primacy of the idea of the perfect over the idea of the imperfect thus remains entirely valid. The idea of the perfect and of infinity is not reducible to the negation of the imperfect. Negativity is incapable of transcendence. Mm. Transcendence designates a relation with a reality infinitely distant from my own reality, yet without this distance destroying this relation and without this relation destroying this distance, as would happen with relations within the same, this relation does not become an implantation in the other and a confusion with him, does not affect the very identity of the same, its ipsaity does not silence the apology, does not become apostasy and ecstasy. We have called this relation metaphysical. It is premature and in any case insufficient to qualify it by opposition to negativity as positive. It would be false to qualify it as theological. 
It is prior to the negative or affirmative proposition. It first institutes language where neither the no nor the yes is the first word. The description of this relation is the central issue of the present research. And that's section three. And that's a mic drop. I feel like that, I feel like that section was a banger. Um, I think what I got out of it is specifically him talking about how it's, it's not a negativity, but down here when he's talking about, it's, it's also not positivity. Um, like I, th I think that's him saying it's primordial. Like it's, uh, this, whatever this is comes before this process of dialectics which Hegel is concerned about. Uh, it comes maybe even before, like, I don't know, maybe before, where's he talking about Cartesian? I think that's, I think the, that's paragraph the next. Above. Yeah, it might be the next one, too, where we okay. get into Descartes. Yeah, I, I, I feel like this section is, is super-duper thick, um, and I like it. It gets me going. It turns me on. But, Same. but, uh, I feel like I'm missing a lot. Like, I feel like it's overflowing my capacity to understand. Maybe that's the point. And I, I think that's why he like does that whole like wave thing. Cause it's like, I'll, I'll splash you a little bit and then it's like, I'm going to move on and then come back to it. And that's when it starts clicking, at least for me, or I pretend it does. Yeah. <laughs> you say splash, but I use the word drowning. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah. That too. Fixiating. The the Cartesian part too, I liked because when I when I first read like Descartes as a kid and the ontological argument when I was in college, you're kind of like, that's totally bullshit. But I think the the main tenet from it that a lot of people say now is it's more just like him trying to, I think it was Dave was talking about it. It's like, you have to like see Descartes in his Malou. And I was like, he's more just trying to talk about the idea of perfection. And I think for Levinas, infinity is that like prior to, like we all have an idea of what infinity is, but we can't conceptualize it like, mathematically we can't conceptualize it so i think that is also the the prior to it's not yeah it's not it, something uh, like it, it resists language it resists it resists cognition in this sense like you, no you can you can conceptualize it like you mm -hmm. as a as a single subject can conceptualize mm -hmm. it but there's no possible way for you like once you try to put it in language, it fails. Um, mm. I like that. I mean, and that's going back to the preface where he's talking about this, this idea of infinity that overflows the notion of infinity. Um, it's, it's like, like it's, he's saying, it's like Russell's incompleteness theorem. Like the set, the set of all set that contains itself is like, or the set yeah. of all sets that contain themselves isn't part of the set of all sets or like, it's, it's this, uh, mm paradox but it's only paradoxical because we treat language as if language is primordial but levinas is saying no this what he names that this infinity is primordial um yeah i like it my only note from all of this was th these are my own words we can refuse elements of our world, but we are still reacting to our world. The other is the thing that is truly outside our world. Mm. So that's what I, I was kind of thinking what he meant by negativity is, um, well, when he says transcendence is not negativity, as in you can, you can uh, I guess if I'm to, I started thinking of like maybe Zizekian uh, ideas here of like what are the transgressions that are still allowed by your uh, your uh, world? 
um, even though they are transgressions. And when you encounter the other, I think Levinas would say, yeah, but this is a transgression that's like, uh, it could really like, would really like burst your world asunder, you know? Hmm. Um, it's, it's a, a transgression that might not be so easily accepted hmm. in, to maintain your, your fatherland world. Hmm. But who knows? Yeah, That's... this is these are just starting thoughts. Yeah, I no, I, I I like that because I immediately go like when he's talking about negativity, positivity, transcendence. Like I immediately go to dialectics where it's less about um the idea of of like belonging. And transgression and more about like uh identity covering up the thing itself and like like the notion erasing kind of the thing and like neg like negativity is this lack um and then you go through this process of kind of failed identifications and through that process of failed identifications magically this positivity appears and that positivity is like the identity of the thing but it's interesting to to think about like transgression and belonging as facets of identity um because they are like like that that is a, a thing that has to do with identity you th and like you said the fatherland like this other being too radically other to be incorporated into the notion of your fatherland like that is um part of like this dialectical identity thing i j honestly i think it's a bigger brained reading than i was coming at it with like i think i was just oh i know those words i know what they mean but i th i think your take is actually more thought uh, thoughtful so i like that not bigger brain bigger heart <laughs> oh <laughs> trying to grow oh. our hearts here yeah <laughs> that's oh. good too because it's ethics is what he's doing and i feel like my reading of it is sort of still in like him making sort of a new ontology in a sense with like the ethics sprinkled in mm -hmm. and i feel like you're actually like putting the human element and Dude. like you're saying the feeling in the heart and i think i think that's a good i'll have to marinate on that some more but mm -hmm. uh, i like i like what you're saying so sorry's gonna hold our feet to the fire when it comes down to yeah. because take a look just like i was saying um over the weekend, ethic, like thinking about ethics is hard and I, I run away from it. Oh, yeah. I, ch I, I choose not to go there. Um, but that's central to this book. Like that's what's going on. So yeah, for sure. All right. Section four. Who's got it? Oh, I'll, I'll take it. Cool. All right, section four, metaphysics precedes ontology. It is not by chance that the theoretical relation has been the preferred scheme of the metaphysical relation. Knowledge or theory designates first a relation with being such that the knowing being lets the known being manifest itself while respecting its alterity and without marking it in any way, whatever, by this cognitive relation. In this sense, metaphysical desire would be the essence of theory. But theory also designates comprehension, intelligence, the logos of being that is a way of approaching the known being such that its alterity with regard to the knowing being vanishes. The process of cognition is at this stage identified with the freedom of the knowing being encountering nothing which other with respect to it could limit it. This mode of depriving the known being of its alterity can be accomplished only if it is aimed at through a third term, a neutral term, which itself is not a being 
in it the shock of the encounter of the same with the other is dead in it. This third term may appear as a concept, though. Then the individual that exists abdicates into the general that is thought. The third term may be called sensation, in which objective quality and subjective affection are merged. It may appear as being distinguished from the existent. Being, which at the same time is not, that is not posited as an existent, and yet corresponds to the work applied by the existent, which is not a nothing. Being, which is without the density of ex existence, is the light in which existence becomes intelligible. To theory as comprehension of beings, the general title ontology is appropriate. Ontology, which reduces the other to the same, promotes freedom. The freedom that is the identification of the same, not allowing itself to be alienated by the other. Here, theory enters upon a course that renounces metaphysical desire, capital D desire, renounces the marvel of exteriority from which that desire lives. But theory, understood as a respect for exteriority, delineates another structure essential for metaphysics. In its comprehension of being, or ontology, it is concerned with critique. It discovers the dogmatism and naive arbitrariness of its spontaneity and calls into question the freedom of the exercise of ontology. It then seeks to exercise this freedom in such a way as to turn back at every moment to the origin of the arbitrary dogmatism of this free exercise. This would lead to an infinite regression if this return itself remained an ontological movement, an exercise of freedom, a theory. It is, its critical intention then leaves it beyond theory and ontology. Critique does not reduce the other to the same, as does ontology, but calls into question the exercise of the same. A calling into question of the same, which cannot occur without the egoist spontaneity of the same, is brought about by the other. We name this calling into question of my spontaneity by the presence of the other ethics, the strangeness of the other, his irreducibility to the I, to my thoughts and my possessions, is precisely accomplished as a calling into question of my spontaneity as ethics. Metaphysics, transcendence, the welcome of the other by the same of the other by me, is concretely produced as the calling into question of the same by the other. And it is as the ethics that accomplishes the critical essence of knowledge and as critique precedes dogmatism, metaphysics precedes ontology. Western philosophy has most often been an ontology, a reduction of the other to the same by the interposition of a middle and neutral term that ensures the comprehension of being. This primacy of the same was Socrates' teaching, to receive nothing of the other but what is in me, as though from all eternity I was in possession of what comes to me from the outside, to receive nothing, or to be free. Freedom does not resemble the capricious spontaneity of free will. Its ultimate meaning lies in this permanence in the same, which is reason. Cognition is the deployment of this identity. It is freedom. That reason in the last analysis, would be the manifestation of a freedom, neutralizing the other and encompassing him, can come as no surprise once it was laid down that sovereign reason knows only itself, that nothing other limits it. The neutralization of the other, who becomes a theme or an object, appearing that is taking its place in the light, is precisely his reduction to the same. To know ontologically is to surprise in an existent confronted that by which it is not this existent, this stranger, that by which it is somehow betrayed, surrenders, is given in the horizon in which it loses itself and appears, lays itself open to grasp, becomes a concept. To know amounts to grasping being out of nothing or reducing it to nothing, removing it, uh, removing from it its alterity. This result is obtained from the moment of the first ray of light. To illuminate is to remove from being its resistance, 
because light opens a horizon and empty space, delivers being out of nothingness. Mediation, characteristic of Western philosophy, is meaningful only if it is not limited to reducing distances. For how could intermediaries reduce the intervals between terms infinitely distant? Will not the intervals between the midpoints, progressively staked out ad infinitum, appear always equally untraversable? If an exterior and foreign being is to surrender itself to intermediaries, there must be produced somewhere a great betrayal. As far as the things are concerned, a surrender is carried out in their conceptualization. As for man, it can be obtained by the terror that brings a free man under the domination of another. For the things the work of ontology consists in apprehending the individual, which alone exists, not in its individuality, but in its generality, of which alone there is science. The relation with the other is here accomplished only through a third term which I find in myself. The ideal of Socratic truth thus rests on the essential self-sufficiency of the same, its identification in ipseity, its egoism. Philosophy is an egoology. Um, how many more paragraphs? Oh, that was just one. That was just one paragraph. I, I think it was. Two. was yeah, it? I think he did two. Yeah, it was oh, two. Okay. All right, Berkeley's idealism, which passes for a philosophy of the immediate, also answers to the ontological problem. Berkeley found in the very qualities of objects the hold they offered to the eye, in recognizing in qualities which removed the things from us most. Their lived essence, he spanned the distance, separating the subject from the object. The coinciding of lived experience with itself was revealed to be a coinciding of thought with an existent. The work of comprehension lay in this coincidence. Thus, Berkeley immerses all sensible qualities in the lived experience of affection. Phenomenological mediation follows another route where the ontological imperialism is yet more visible. It is the being of existence that is the medium of truth. Truth regarding an existent presupposes the prior openness of being. To say that the truth of an existent proceeds from the openness of being is, in any event, to say that its intelligibility is due not to our coinciding but to our non-coinciding with it. An existent is comprehended in the measure that thought transcends it, measuring it against the horizon whereupon it is profiled. Since Husserl, the whole of phenomenology is the promotion of the idea of horizon, for which it plays a role equivalent to that of the concept in classical idealism. An existent arises upon a ground that extends beyond it, as an individual arises from a concept. But what commands the non-coinciding of thought with the existent? The being of the existent, which guarantees the independence and the extra extraneity of the existent, is a phosphorescence, luminosity, a generous effulgence. The existing of an existent of an existant is converted into intelligibility. Its independence is a surrender in radiation. See, that's beautiful, dude. He's, he's having fun. Oh, yeah. To broach and exist it from being is simultaneously to let it be and to comprehend it. Reason seizes upon an existent through the void and nothingness of existing, holy light and phosphorescence. Approached from being... From the luminous horizon where it has a silhouette but has lost its face, an existent is the very appeal that is addressed in comprehension, addressed to comprehension. Being in time has argued perhaps but one sole thesis. Being is inseparable from the comprehension of being, 
which unfolds as time. Being is already an appeal to subjectivity. Damn. The primacy... Like that... Summing up being in time in one sentence. Yeah. Fuck it. Too. Yeah, dude. Go... Swinging for the fences, dude. He's got balls on him. And I don't disagree. I would not, I don't take issue with that summation at all. Because, because he says, being is inseparable from the comprehension of being, which unfolds mm-hmm. as time. Being is already an appeal to subjectivity. Like, yeah, that's a great fucking summation of being in time. Like, it, it really is. Anyway, uh, the primacy of ontology for Heidegger does not rest on the truism to know an existent it is necessary to have comprehended the being of existence to affirm the priority of being over existence is to already decide the essence of philosophy it is to subordinate the relation with someone who is an existent the ethical relation to a relation with the being of existence which impersonal permits the apprehension, the domination of existence, a relationship of knowing, subordinates justice to freedom. (laughs) If freedom denotes the mode of remaining the same in the midst of the other, knowledge, where an existent is given by interposition of impersonal being, contains the ultimate sense of freedom. It would be opposed to justice, which involves obligations with regard to an existent that refuses to give itself the other, who in this sense would be an existent par excellence, in subordinating every relation with existence to the relation with being, the Heideggerian ontology affirms the primacy of freedom over ethics. To be sure, the freedom involved in the essence of truth is not for Heidegger a principle of free will. Freedom comes from an obedience to being. It is not man who possesses freedom, it is freedom that possesses man. But the dialectic which thus reconciles freedom and obedience in the concept of truth presupposes the primacy of the same, which marks the direction of and defines the whole of Western philosophy. Was that three or two? Um, I'll I'll take it. I felt like that was a long truck either way. The relation with being that is enacted as ontology consists in neutralizing the existent in order to comprehend or grasp it. It is hence not a relation with the other as such, but the reduction of the other to the same. Such is the definition of freedom. To maintain oneself against the other, despite every relation with the other, to ensure the uh, autocracy of an eye, sorry, words are hard, thematization and conceptualization, which moreover are inseparable, are not peace with the other, but suppression or possession of the other. For possession affirms the other, but within a negation of its independence, I think comes down to I can, to an appropriation of what is, to an exploitation of reality. Ontology is first philosophy, is a philosophy of power. It issues in the state and in the nonviolence of the totality, without securing itself against the violence from which this nonviolence lives, and which appears in the tyranny of the state. Truth, which should reconcile persons here, exists anonymously. Universality presents itself as impersonal, and that is another inhumanity. And I think what's interesting is not to like attribute the philosopher to his philosophy, but you can kind of see how being in time is played out in Heidegger himself and like the more fascist because it's like aligning yourself with how being discloses itself. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, that's like, that's my main issue with Heidegger is, is that he still kind of clings to, I don't know, a a teleology and and he kind of clings to this, this, uh, you're kind you're fulfilled by the call of duty and, um mm-hmm. and all this fascist shit and it like it's i hate to use the word fascist cuz it's mm-hmm. overused but i do i do think like heidegger's fatal flaws is just this like the fact that he was like no things are filled out by fo- like 
their purpose. Like once they kind of culminate mm-hmm. their purpose, then things are filled out. And that's what being is all about. And it like, and it's like, no, that's wrong, Heidegger. And you made a mistake. Um, mm-hmm. You were a bitch ass Nazi. And then your brain broke and you went and wrote fucking gay poetry. And <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, you I became his fucking grandson yeah. and is doing the same thing, kind of. Yeah, it, it just shows where it, where that theology and that yeah. understanding comes from when it's doing the fundamental ontology. Yeah, and that's why I like this, this kind of like, like Dave says, ethical expansion pack mm. to vegan time. So. Mm-hmm. I'm excited. I just want to throw that out there real quick. The egoism of ontology is maintained even when denouncing Socratic philosophy as already forgetful of being and already on the way to the notion of the subject. And technological power, Heidegger finds in pre-Socraticism thought as obedience to the truth of being. This obedience would be accomplished in existing as builder and cultivator, affecting the unity of the site which sustains space. In bringing together presence on the earth and under the firmament of the heavens, the waiting for the gods, the company of mortals, and the presence to the things, which is to build and to cultivate. Heidegger, with the whole of Western history, takes the relation with the other as enacted in the destiny destiny of sedentary peoples, the possessors and builders of the earth. Possession is preeminently the form in which the other becomes the same by becoming mine. In denouncing the sovereignty of the technological powers of man, Heidegger exalts the pre-technological powers of possession. His analyses do not start with the thing object, to be sure, but they bear the mark of the great landscapes to which the things refer. Ontology becomes ontology of nature, impersonal fecundity, faceless, generous mother, matrix of particular beings, inexhaustible matter for things. A philosophy of power, ontology is as first philosophy, which does not call into question the same, a philosophy of injustice. Even though it opposes the technological passion issued forth from the forgetting of being hidden by existence, Heideggerian ontology, which subordinates the relationship with the other to the relation with being in general, remains under obedience to the anonymous and leads inevitably to another power, to imperialist domination deteriorating. Tyranny is not the pure and simple extension of technology to reified men. Its origin lies back in the pagan moods and the rootedness in the earth and the adoration that enslaved men can devote to their masters. Being before the existent ontology before metaphysics is freedom, be it the freedom of theory before justice. It is a movement within the same before obligation to the other. So before I, I go on with this, um, am I right in in interpreting that Levinas is saying that Heidegger is arguing that ontology becomes before metaphysics and that Levinas is, is stating the opposite of, no, I, I, I'm saying metaphysics becomes before ontology. Um, and if that's so... I don't really know enough about Heidegger um, to know what what maybe he's taking issue with, if uh, either of you know. Like Heidegger does this thing where he's like, we can get back to like the primordial essence of being. Um, and there's always like, when I, when I read Heidegger, like there's always this thing gnawing at me where it's like, he's not talking about being like he's sneaking in. He's talking about correctness, properness. And he is talking about like this teleological justification for, for being. And it leaves open, um, people to do this to do this thing where, um, I mean, it leaves the door open for like, uh, the scientific racism and spiritual racism. What's the word I'm thinking of? Scientific racism, like the genetic, like eugenics, eugenics. Yes. Heidegger leaves the door open for eugenics. 
um, Heidegger, and Heidegger is very much a spiritual racist. Uh, and mm -hmm. he talks about like uprooted people are further away from this primordial essence and you need to be rooted and you need to be sedentary. You need to act on the world. You need to be a builder and a possessor and this and that. Um, and it, it's always, that's not all Heidegger does. Like Heidegger does dope shit. Like Heidegger is, mm. is a Titan of philosophy. Um, he's also like, I don't fucking like him because it like that spiritual racism is, is always present in Heidegger when I read it. So, and that, like, that comes from the fact that he's doing this thing where he's like, there's a proper way to be. There's a correct version of being, and there's an incorrect version of being. And we, like German Germans, Dasein, German Dasein is the correct Dasein. Um, and it seems to be predicated on, on his ontology and Levinas seems to be coming around and saying like, well, that's bullshit, dude, because you can have all that. But that erases this infinity. Which, so when he's talking about being versus existence, T-E-N-T-S, like plural of existent, Heidegger is concerned with being, capital B, German Dasein. And Levinas is like, I'm concerned with the motherfucker across the street from me. He's just as valid in this ontological, metaphysical, phenomenological sense because he's an infinity. He is, he is an existent as opposed to a being or a Dasein. Um, so yeah, like Levinas is like, like saying like, no, Heidegger, you're like, you, you're smelling your own farts. You are convinced that you have figured out the true, correct, proper way to, to exist as Dasein, but in doing so, you're, you're claiming that unless you do it my way, like if, if you're not down with OPP, then fuck you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot you because you're a bitch. Like, like essentially, Heidegger is, is doing this spiritual racism shit and Levinas is coming around and he's like, no, we're all, we're all humans, every single one of us. And so that like metaphysical infinity is prior to this scientific ontology that kind of comes up in the wake of German idealism and gets used to justify a bunch of horrible shit too. Yeah, OPP. I was just gonna... <laughs> OPP could be a otherness phenomenological <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> just, you could tell people, are you down with OPP? That's yeah, gotta be a me. meme. That has to be a meme now. I was just going to add real quick that I think to like Heidegger's like big stick is all the all the OPP came from like he thinks if we go back to the Greeks and like read the pre-Socratics like will and Alice counter and, uh, how, yeah. yeah how being and everything disclosed itself and that comes before metaphysics so he was big on this like fundamental ontology that's like we're already beings in the world and we already like are here for existence to be a problem for himself. So he kind of put like ontology before metaphysics and it kind of makes sense. But the problem is, I think like Nance is saying, Levinas is like, you're missing out on the metaphysics that you're doing, mm. which justifies like what you're doing with your ontology. Like there's a correct like way of being, and that's the German folk and the, their blood and soil. And he's kind of saying like, no, like you're forgetting like, your neighbor and like that ethical relation. And when you forget that, that's kind of how you have like Hitler writing in his little diary, like Hitler's not going far enough. Why? Wow, he's not listening to me. That it's, <laughs> yeah. You get Levin ass, like, all right, hold my beer. Let me write a totality infinity. Yeah. And like Levin as a, as a student of Heidegger, um, mm -hmm. And a respecter of, of Heidegger, like he respected the shit out of Heidegger and, and he oh, yeah. kind of had front row seats to what Heidegger was doing. And, and so he's like, yeah, you did a bunch of really, really cool shit, especially like this notion of being and time and um, being is like, we're already here. Like, that's the thing and uncovering and discovering. And it's like, yeah, all that shit's dope, but you're missing 
like he's fetishizing Alethea as uncovered mm-hmm. truth or whatever. And, and yeah. Um, and he has some purchase on it that other people don't yes. because of what their religion is or where they are geographically, which doesn't even make sense. Like I did a anthropology project and I literally used Heidegger's concept of ground to basically talk about how the Aztecs had just as big of a folk, if not more, and were Dude. connected to the earth and used his own term. And my anthropology professor's like, I really like that. And I was like, it's my little fuck you to Heidegger. That's sick. Because it's like, I got to take your ideas and show you how you're right, but also wrong, because it could be applied to insert any people. That's sick. That's a dope so, burn, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's my uh, little like, inside joke. Little tangent. My flavor of autism. L- yeah, little little tangent. Uh, I don't want to derail, but you said anthropology, and that reminded mm. me last night at dinner, my daughter told me she thinks I'm an alien scientist. She thinks I'm an alien anthropologist and that I came to earth and I, and like, I'm an anthropologist because like, I just do weird okay. shit and I study people. And she's like, that's why you're into philosophy. Cause you're an alien researcher trying to understand humans. And I was like, well, yeah, that's, that's it. Maybe I am oh. an alien. <laughs> <laughs> that's anyway, awesome. that's, I've that's also been called an alien before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're all alien. Awesome. And and yeah. it's embracing the alienness of the other um, that allows, allows us all to kind of come together and do what it is we're trying to do. We're all fucking alien anthropologists. In fact, if you're here at Theory Underground and you're, you're not an alien, then you're from the fucking yeah. CIA. You're either an alien yeah. or a fed. So It's true. <laughs> um. So I'm, I'm almost thinking the way y'all kind of gave the descriptions of what Heidegger thinks of being. Um, I, I don't want to really reduce it down, um, but I feel like if I, if, if I had to start talking about this, maybe to like uh, just some coworkers or like my family, not using, not name dropping philosophers or their concepts, I think the way I would uh, ease them into the conversation of this is that, okay, Heidegger is maybe talking about something like a, um, let's just kind of call it selfishness or like the self-interestedness of an organism, Mm -hmm. right? Whereas... um, you could also point to other parts of nature that show um what's the word for it i think it starts with the e where like organisms kind of do things for other organisms uh, uh starts like, with an a what did, i thought i thought autistic i used to altruistic altruism altruistic. yeah okay. altruistic yeah they used to be so my graf- maybe levinas's my tag. position yeah levinas's position would be uh Ooh. oh he, he's thinking about organisms more of in an altruistic way or are not completely self-interested that there's a calling to altruism um that might not be purely like still beneficial for the uh the initial organism uh and i'm almost starting to think then okay I wonder I wonder where Levinas might be how he's going to want to talk about this this like initial impulse that we have of wanting to discover the other when it doesn't seem like it could benefit us at all <laughs> you know and it this seems maybe specifically like a human thing because it's hard to know what other creatures if they if they know what they're doing with their actions in the same way that humans do but there's this thing of like why do humans bother going out of their fatherland right where like i don't know if levinas will will maybe speculate as to what why what that result is or maybe that's exactly what he means by this metaphysics comes before we're even we're even a being in that 
we don't get to decide <laughs> uh, if we want to discover other fatherlands or not because it's already been decided for us by some kind of something else that like uh that is not our own choice like um like a uh like a drive i mean you you could mm. you could posit that that it's another drive uh the drive the mm -hmm. drive to transcend the self um i like it a lot dude i don't know but i do know um when you when you were talking about like why why do we why do we do this it brought up a thought that i've been having and i've been reading lumen uh nicholas lumen for shit that i'm trying to write for the upcoming volumes and i want to find a way to kind of incorporate levinas into lumen cuz i feel like lumen was also escaping heidegger but he did it in this totally different functionalistic way which is has a lot of a lot in common with heidegger if you get down to it like it's very it's very functionalistic it's very like well a thing it doesn't so much matter what very a, german yeah it doesn't really matter what a thing is it, it like identity is born by the by what the thing does as opposed to what the thing is so like this question of a table is only a table when it's when things are resting on top of it and when nothing is resting on top of it, maybe it's something else. Or when I am down on the floor and my kid sits on my back, I'm a table for the moment. And so I functionally in, in identity. And I, I like that approach to things, but it only gets you so far. You still have to go beyond it. And so I've been trying to use Levinas to go beyond functionalism and systems theory. And I think it can be done, which is why I'm, I'm trying to do it. But in, in Lumen, um, you get the sense that the world is the dark forest. So the, like the dark forest is an answer to the, the Fermi paradox. Why don't we see aliens all over the... Like, why haven't we encountered aliens? One of the solutions to the Fermi paradox is that it's a dark forest and the universe is a dangerous place. So all the intelligent... Uh, civilizations are hiding from each other because mm, they're they're a bunch of nimbies yeah but they're it's it's like uh once once these civilizations reach a level of techn technological proficiency that they could explore the universe they realize mm -hmm. oh it is a zero-sum game if even if i'm not hostile even if i have pure intentions my neighbors might not understand that. And so my neighbors are going to be hostile. And so they're going to adopt a protective stance and it will be an escalation and it will eventually become an arms race because even if I'm genuine and even if they're genuine, we could both be genuine explorers, peaceful explorers, but because we cannot know for sure, we will necessarily adopt a defensive warlike position and that'll escalate and that'll escalate and that'll escalate till eventually there's war and so smart civilizations just hide from each other and i don't think this is true i i disagree with the dark forest hypothesis but it's very prevalent in lumen lumen's social systems theory is very much this zero sum game of this dark forest and i think levinas is like well yeah you can't know you may never know and in fact you will never know that's part of being the I is that you can't know the other. However, we are humans and there is this metaphysical something drive to connect, to transcend ourselves and to get out there and be in there with the others. Um, and I, I do think that's true, but I don't know where or if Levinas explicitly states that we do have this drive. But I... I agree with you. I think I think he is saying that. As opposed to yeah. just being concerned with I'm just gonna be. He's like, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna be cool. Cause we all know yeah. that being cool is the right thing to do. Wasn't that what Hawking too 
was like saying before he died when he was like really cynical he was like oh if aliens come here they're gonna take all our resources kill us and be pirates yeah like, he also he was like a pervert yeah. so he's I'm wrong gonna... in on he's wrong on two counts yeah, on two he's definitely not seeing the other as a <laughs> yeah affinity dude. and an ethical relation at that point but yeah they left that part out of the the movie yeah um yeah, I guess for the sake of not going on further tangents, just r remind me to bring up uh, the topics of like Nicholas Lumen again. Um, the I would really like to talk about <laughs> other other Trekkies about um, so many like ethical things, like the way you were just explaining the like the mm -hmm. peace encounter or the war encounters of other civilizations. I had just watched the Darmok episode again of uh, TNG. The walls fell, at... man. The walls <laughs> fell. Darmok and Jalad on the ocean. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> like, I, I, I want. There's like a specific episode that I thought was like, oh, this is Levinas. This is totally an infinity. Hell um, yeah. But yeah, just remind me about about that later. Hell yeah. Do that as a movie. Was there a third? I don't I don't think there was a maybe the third was just uh I just enjoyed you saying spiritual racist <laughs> because I started I started it's thinking true. of the pe like people who say things like I'm not religious but I'm spiritual, <laughs> I'm spiritual. racist. <laughs> <laughs> no, Heidegger legitimately calls himself a spiritual racist in in the Black Notebooks. He literally mm. he says like racism is stupid but I've discovered a cool way to be racist and it's spiritual racism. Like he doesn't literally say that, but he does use the words. So many words. Like he, he does say, I'm a spiritual racist. Um, it's, it's in the, it's in the, actually it's in the 24 hour stream. Dave and I did with, uh, Richard Volan's book. I don't know where, but if anybody's interested in going down a deep Heidegger rabbit hole, um, check out the Theory Underground YouTube channel. We went through the rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, oh, I think if I read my paragraphs, it'll finish us up with this particular section. Um, so I think that could be a good... I, I feel like we should at least do that. Um, let's see... If I can remember where we left off, do any the, of you know? The terms the must terms be reversed. Must be. Ah, okay. The terms must be reversed. For the philosophical tradition, the conflicts between the same and the other are resolved by theory, whereby the other is reduced to the same. Or concretely, by the community of the state, where beneath anonymous power, Though it be intelligible, the eye rediscovers war in the tyrannic oppression it undergoes from the totality. Ethics, where the same takes the irreducible other into account, would belong to opinion. The effort of this book is directed toward a, a perceiving in discourse a non-allergic relation with alterity toward a perceiving big D desire where power by essence murderous of the other becomes faced with the other and against all good sense, the impossibility of murder, the consideration of the other or justice. Concretely, our effort consists in maintaining with an anonymous community the society of the I with the other, language and goodness. This relation is not pre-philosophical, for it does not do violence to the I, is not imposed upon it brutally from the outside, despite itself, or being unbeknown to it, as an opinion. More exactly, it is imposed upon the I beyond all violence, by a violence that calls it entirely into question. 
the ethical relation, opposed to first philosophy, which identifies freedom and power, is not contrary to truth. It goes unto being in its absolute exteriority and accomplishes the very intention that animates the movement unto truth. The relationship with a being infinitely distant, that is, overflowing its idea, is such that its authority as, as an existent is already invoked in every question we could raise concerning the meaning of its being. One does not question oneself concerning him. One questions him. Always he faces. If ontology, the comprehension, the embracing of being, is impossible, it is not because every definition of being already presupposes the knowledge of being, as Pascal had said and Heidegger refutes in the first pages of Being in Time. It is because the comprehension of being in general cannot dominate the relationship with the other. The latter relationship commands the first. I cannot disentangle myself from society with the other when I consider the being of the, ex of the existent he is. Already the comprehension of being is said to the existent who again arises behind the theme in which he is presented. This saying to the other, this relationship with the other as interlocutor, this relation with an existent, precedes all ontology. It is the ultimate relation in being. Ontology presupposes metaphysics. So, I feel like this paragraph is very thick. I feel like it's very compressed. Um, not because every definition of being already presupposes the knowledge of being, as Pascal said and Heidegger refutes in the first pages of Being in Time. It is because the comprehension of being in general cannot dominate the relationship with the other. I feel like that that's the main course of this paragraph, I think. And, and, and again, it's just going back to this thing where apples don't equal oranges. And I can be an apple, and you can be an orange, and we can be fruits, and we can be nutritious, and we can be tasty, and we can grow on trees, and we can share so many things in common. However, apples do not equal oranges, and I, I can't, like, be more concerned with the identity. We are both fruit. We are both fruit that grows on trees. That's the identity. That's the equal sign. Like, that, <clears throat> that is not primordial, more primordial than your orangeness. That's that third neutral term he talks yes. about. Yes, yes. Your, your orangeness pre precedes our fruitness. So we can both be tree growing fruit and that's beautiful and that's amazing. And we can get along based on that. But there is something more primordial than our tree growing fruitness. And it is your orangeness and your peachness and my appleness or like, like there is this thing that will always resist totalization. Um, And, and focusing on the, the totalizing identity erases that, covers it up. It's ideology. I, I feel like that's kind of the big home run of this first chapter even. But it's also, I mean, it's thick. Like the, this... This book bears being dwelled with. Like, it, it really is, like, we've read, what, 
like 15 pages total. Yeah. Um, not today, but like in, in total, we're <laughs> like, we're like a dozen pages into this book and I feel like it's, it's already, there's more substance than a fucking lot of other books at least yeah um do you do y'all have a way that you're you're gonna approach this text of i mean i'm kind of thinking of it two ways either there's the approach of reading it uh all the way through and knowing that you're just gonna have to mm, not not stay around for for like a lot of it and maybe have to come back to it at, at another time. Um, but, you know, just kind of finishing the race in a sense, or are you kind of going for the approach of, I'm going to maybe just sit with a few pages at a time, even if I don't get to the, the goal of the week of the, what the reading end is for that week. But I did, I kind of lived in like a couple of pages or, Porque no los dos. Like approaching it? Hmm? Porque no los dos. I think. Mm. Well, because because <laughs> you'd either be stuck in one, or you'd have to like be like, you know what? Like, I just had to read this. Uh, like not necessarily like read it to impress yourself, but or maybe it read, is. Read it to get it done. The completionist. No. Sense. Yeah. yeah. There's like the knowing the that you won't you won't get it. So, you know? yeah. getting uh speechify or natural reader or any of these other uh apps that will read your pdfs to you out loud is i think it's an essential tool in, in our tool chest so i have the pdf in my speechify library that i listened to and i've listened to the whole thing and that was my first pass with the book is just put it on play and listen and and go work go work out go skateboard whatever to get through it that and that's the first pass and then i have careful reading sessions where i zoom in and it'll be one section i'll sit on one section and kind of go through it and do the slog and go back and read and reread and reread and then i'm also at the point where now i'll listen to I'll listen to a section while I'm doing other shit. And it's kind of like an in-between of doing this cursory first pass and this deep dive. Cause it's like, I'm, I'll, I'm skateboarding. Like I'm not studying. Like I'm not super focused on studying. I'm out skateboarding, but I'm listening to this, this section. So while I'm doing that, it's, working and the gears are going and it's doing the work in the background so I, I i think it's all of it all of the above i think that's um the best way to read is and yeah i think having that pressure to f to finish a certain section on time it's good because it motivates you to read but it also it it is there to give you something to transgress like you're reading this book because you fucking care about this book so if you want to maximize the benefit of having done it, do it for real. So if, if it takes you three weeks to finish one, one, uh, one chapter, so be it. Like no one's here. We're not going to shit on you or kick you out or call you a bitch. We're going to be like, you did it the right way. So I, I think it's both like go over it, get it done, finish the race. And kind of no pressure, low stakes, but also do this deep, obsessive, focused study of it. And you're the one who sets the schedule for that type of study. What if I'm motivated by being called a bitch, though? <laughs> I mean, we can arrange that. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, David I, Goggins of Total yeah. Infinity. I'm sure Dave will happily. <laughs> happy call any of us a bitch if yeah. we only ask him <laughs> um but i think i think you're already doing okay. it I, th I think you're already doing it uh i know christopher is uh familiar with that style of reading because we like mm -hmm. we've 
we did being in time together. Like that's, and again, this is just opinion, but it's also like, we we're figuring this shit out together. And it seems to be for the most part, the best way to do it is all of the above. Give it a cursory first pass to get familiar, come back to it, read it, deep focus study sessions, doing these co-reading sessions. Dude, that, that shit set my brain on fire when, when we started doing these. I think this is, so like step one is the cursory first pass. Step two is the personal deep focus study. Step three is these exegetical sessions and co-reading sessions and shit. Um, and then step four is, you know, a year from now, you might pick the book up and, and restart it all over again, go through the whole process all over again. And each time you do, you're going to come back to it and realize, oh, I'm more comfortable here. I know the terminology. I know the arguments. I know the field. Um, and I understand what's happening a little more and i like these books will, will ne none of us will ever be done reading them i mean unless unless you just move on to other things but like like we're all moving in the same direction but none of us are gonna get there before anyone else like that's the point of why we're doing this together like all all of the above dude and i For think me too oops sorry I just I think the the kind of change in format with uh, the discussions and the lectures coming after the or the the lectures coming after the readings like or the discussion I don't know I th I think that's going to be interesting I think it's actually going to inspire me to write more than I did when we did it the other way around when we did the reading before the lectures and discussions um Cause it's, it's like, yeah, it's like, we're all on the same page together and it, fuck, I, I know there's going to be weeks when I don't finish the, the required reading. I like, I already know that's going to happen. Um, and I just, I come to the table and it, it's not so much about like, what am I bringing to the table? But it's like, oh, there's a table over there. Those guys are working. I'm going to go work with those guys. And we all come together and work together. No, I, I agree with that. I was going to say, I look at it too, as it's like when I was reading Being in Time and like the beginning where it's like, okay, I'm reading 20 pages here or there. I would just try to slog through the section, go back, do exactly what you're saying. But it's kind of like learning a language and it's like you can sit there and like use your workbook and do like the lessons, but it's like if you're like watching TV in that language and then if you're having conversations in it, so it's like, I try to approach it the same way. So it's like, I'll do my little like work. I'll read whatever it is for the week. I'll listen to it. I'll go back and read sections. I'll read other stuff by Levinas, like before he wrote Totality Infinity, just to like get a feel for where his head was at. Cause it's like, maybe that'll be, just let me get familiar with how he's talking, even if I don't understand it. Like, I just read Time and the Other, and I probably understood, like, a third of it. But at least it, like, is marinating. And as we're reading this, I'm like, oh, okay, I saw that word before I approached it. And it just helps it click. Especially, like, just the obsessiveness in me. As opposed to, like, I'm going to watch four different people on YouTube talk about it or explain it for me and it's like it's not i'm getting their understanding I'm sure that helps sometimes but it's like i'll only do that after i've like read it tarried with it and other stuff because that way i can not let it completely color my perception and i think that helps too just kind of like dude and it's fun to watch people get shit yeah. wrong it's fun to watch <laughs> it and too. like if you watch the shit Living awesome in four minutes yeah like if if you go into that before really tarrying with the text you don't know but like there is an enjoyment that i get out of consuming other people's content and it's not like i do it that often but when i do it's always dos Equis. no when i do i i enjoy being like oh that guy got that shit wrong and i know because i read the fuck out of that book like 
or whose argument they're parroting off of some other guy. Yeah. Wrong or yeah, like yeah, yeah. And you're like, okay. You can see the game of telephone go down the pipeline. Yeah. Um, I might just be able to be here for just a little bit longer. So there's like four pages left. Do we want to, do we want to stretch and hit these four pages or do we want to kind of have a Ooh. little more loose freeform discussion? I'm up for either. Yeah, I'm for either. I say, uh, Cesar, uh, since he's the one in the time brunch what is uh what what's the page number we're trying to read to it's like 50. for thursday Eight. oh for thursday 58? uh it's 80 81 i think yeah. 81 i think so uh, i think he set up to d unless i'm <sighs> oh we're not going that far um <laughs> i thought he said uh a through d or maybe I was looking at a different. Let me take my schizophrenic medicine that day. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I might have read too much. Let's see. Anybody have the syllabus ready to hand? Ready Nine. at hand. Nine. Nine. I it's could pull it up. Uh, racist, I think. Yeah. I could pull it up, but I'm being lazy. But let me. I, I, I got it. Okay. Yeah, I'm also pulling it up. It says August 10th, part C and D. So uh, just let's see. Section one, parts A and B. That's kind of what I'm seeing. Okay. Yeah. And then so... August 10th, I think I was looking at the same in the other parts C and D. So I might have just been looking for the. But I think you're right. I think it's up to page 81. Yeah. But I think we're barely finishing. Yeah. This is. A. Yeah, this will be the end of A. Um, If we go to page 52 or 4 or whatever. And then uh, section B is a little longer than section A. <laughs> what do you think the people would want? The people who are watching this? Um... I think we will only know retroactively, but we will make a decision a little, for them now. Put, uh, yeah. put a poll on Instagram and we'll wait 20 minutes yeah. like influencers do. I think uh I think Terrence wants us to talk about Star Trek because Terrence probably knows more science fiction and he's probably forgotten more science fiction than I will ever know in my life. And I say that as a compliment because I'm a science fiction nerd and he has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to science fiction, and he doesn't get to show it off here because we don't talk about science fiction. We talk about theory and philosophy. But if we can make it pertinent, I think it's, it's always a good endeavor to do so. And you could put the hashtag on YouTube without lying. Yeah, hashtag Darmok. <laughs> um. mm. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're just going to eventually like take over a whole channel on discord just for all our star trek uh, yeah dude crackpot theories um on philosophy uh so you was there something specifically you wanted to say regarding levinas and star trek um you you said that you'd watched an episode that yeah. screamed levinas to you and i'm interested in that same yeah so it's uh season five of the next generation um it's I think it's at the end of the season, towards the end, and it's the episode called I Borg. And I... um 
maybe maybe I'll give just a little bit of preface for people of um so you have this ship called the Enterprise and it's where our main characters they go exploring around space and um you know they encounter lots of different species of and different civilizations but uh one of the most hostile uh groups that they've encountered so far is called the Borg and they're like these um They're, they're almost like ants or like bees in terms of like a hive mind, collective consciousness kind of being where they don't have individuality. They are, um, uh, they refer to themselves as we. They And are, they are Dasein, the Borg. Are they? They, uh, I mean, I would have to think about that, but I think, yeah, I think that's a good, at least to stick with the themes in this conversation, they do represent kind of the Borg Dasein that's trying to totalize and assimilate the entire galaxy and uh and the enterprise yeah their whole purpose yeah is to take up other civilizations and assimilate them as part of their hive mind um and they they just can't see they can't empathize they can't see beyond their instinct of this is what we do so uh they they ignore you if you're just an individual um but anyways they so the enterprise it finds these uh it it detects some life on a planet so they go explore it and they find an injured borg and Ooh, so they pew. they bring this this borg back onto the ship uh hesitantly because they've dealt with them before and even the captain has been imprisoned and transformed by them um but you know because they're they come in peace as the enterprise they uh they feel the call maybe they maybe they feel the call to have to take care of this borg and and return it back to its uh its colony but initially most of the of the crew is like you know what we have this borg on our ship let's see if we we can't implant a virus into its brain while it's still injured so that when we return it back to its uh, civilization it'll dismantle the borg so that they are no longer a threat to the universe um because if we let them back then uh As far as they know, they there's no way to stop the Borg. Um, they're like too technologically powerful. They have no zero empathy with other beings, um, and so. But we eventually find that this Borg that they rescue, as they keep like um, testing it out and like figuring out how to implant this virus in it, it starts to individuate. It starts to not refer to itself as we and in such a very clear way, it starts to question things that its own uh its own fatherland will say does. Um and uh it eventually it even adopts a name because it just refers to itself as just numbers, but then the crew is like, we'll call you Hugh. Um, and so it starts referring to itself as Hugh. Um, eventually, it even feels that it has friendship with uh, the other crew members on the ship. Um, and a lot of a lot of people on the ship are like so against this because some of their like one of the characters, their civilization was genocided by the Borg. So it's played by Whoopi Goldberg, this character. And uh, so she just has like this like hate towards them, you know, like she just can't bring herself. But but then she said there's she says an interesting thing um, where uh, she's like, I don't know why, but I felt like I had to go visit that thing in its prison cell, in its holding cell. And so that's an interesting thing. She she doesn't even know why herself, why she was called to do that. But she she decided to go visit it and talk to it and even she was convinced that maybe the borg can change 
that maybe there is a chance to actually connect with them or uh, to have her her own perspective changed um, by encountering this other, this thing that was other. Um, so all of that to say is that uh, eventually they returned this this individuated Borg back to its ship because this thing is like, you know what, the rest of my civilization, it will come and assimilate you guys. So I'm going to, even though you're offering me asylum to not return back, I will voluntarily go back to my fatherland in order to save you guys, to save my friend, my new friends. Um, and that's basically how the episode ends is like, it starts off with like, people have very clear ideas of what they think about the others. Um, and they refuse to even uh, engage with them, to even to even entertain that idea. But somehow they, they get little situations placed upon them to where I guess they are kind of forced to to have to like start to accept what the other is. So that specific episode, I was like, ah, totality and infinity. I think this is maybe like the most uh, obvious like sci-fi I could think of right now that like is is talking about this uh, this specific idea. At least what I think the ideas of totality and infinity are. <sighs> That's a uh, Hugh man. I love Hugh. He came back in. Was it? Was it? Picard. Um, I think it was. Picard. Yeah, I haven't caught up on the new, the newer ones yet. Okay. Uh, I mean, they're not great. It's definitely, it's definitely different. But I, just, I watch, I watch it all because I fucking love Star Trek. Hugh has a small role in Picard's season two, or maybe season one. I don't know. But anyway, I love Hugh. Um. Yeah, I think that's great. The uh, Hugh is the face of the uh, like. They see his face. Guinan sees his face, and like that, that kind of confrontation changes her. Um, I think that's a good, like a a great analysis of that episode. It got me thinking of that movie. Is it Kroll? And I think TNG Krolls? had it. Kroll, K R U L L. I can't, I don't think it's Kroll. It's the TNG had an episode where one of the crew members, or maybe it was DS9, I don't know, but like one of the crew members is stranded on a planet with their enemy and they like don't understand each other and they're both in danger, but they have to help each other and in the end they both survive. And that episode was based on a movie. It's not Kroll, Enemy Mine. Is that the fucking Enemy Mind? That might be the movie that I'm thinking of. Yeah, Enemy Mind. Mm -hmm. With uh, Dennis Quaid. Anyway, yeah, it's a similar situation in that the plot revolves around this kind of confrontation with the face of the other. And because the characters kind of have the courage to look into that face they change and they go from being like irrational enemies where they're not, there's no possibility of cooperation. They understand we have to work together. Um, if we want to, if we want to survive. And I think that, 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 that point right there, we have to work together if we want to survive. Probably sounds passe, probably sounds lame and stupid. But it's also true. We're stuck on this planet. Like, for all intents and purposes, we got nowhere to go. Um, and we have to... And it's not even a question of being willing. Because I don't think it comes down to will. I think it comes down to courage. We have to have the courage and the intestinal fortitude to look the other in the face and recognize them as the other and, and say... Like if, if we want to survive, if and not even survive, because Heidegger's obsessed with survival and I think that's lame. Fuck survival. I want to thrive. 
And if we want to thrive, we must cooperate with one another. And I will, like, I can't totalize you. Not only can I not totalize you, but in the act of totalization, I'm kind of foreclosing your ability to thrive in favor of, of my idea of being able to thrive. But I think, I think it's foreclosing everyone's ability to thrive. Like the, the minute you start totalizing, you start, you start down a road that ultimately leads to eugenics and spiritual racism and instrumentalization and mechanization and, and all this fucked up shit. So genocide. Yeah. Um, I, I need to go rewatch that episode. Sorry. I need to rewatch Enemy Mind and I need to find the TNG episode based on Enemy Mind. Cause yeah, I didn't realize there was Levinas in my Star Trek. Probably a philosophy major is one of the writers. Yeah, I wonder I wonder who wrote um Iborg. Who wrote that episode? Yeah, I mean with I think with Star Trek there's actually a lot of episodes that have to deal with encountering the other. I mean, they're constantly traveling around space. So they're always they're always encountering something. Um and uh I'm not sure if this will come up in any of our discussions, but sometimes in Star Trek, they even encounter things that don't have a actual like face or body, but are almost like these beyond human comprehension creatures that they kind of see as like, it still has consciousness or agency, but it's like this alien blob thing that exists you know um or it's like a it's almost like microbial crystal stuff um yeah the crystalline and being. so that yeah crystalline beings um but that makes me think of well our the way that we can think of that in our terms is animals and like uh other other things that we call biology um and i don't know if levinas ever goes into anything like an ethics towards non-human beings you know but i i wonder if someone will bring that up at some point in our discussions mm. other other in a way where it's not human or so obviously human um i wonder if we encounter we can encounter it in the same way or if uh i don't know if maybe this is a very unique human to human kind of phenomenon <laughs> Well, he talks about, too, about the face isn't, like, the human face, so to speak. So I think those entities, in a way, like, if you can recognize it as other and having, like, being or consciousness or just some form of life. And I think even human beings, in a way, already do that sometimes. Like, if you're not a sociopath, it's like you try to move out of the way when a squirrel's in the road or like if you, if you accidentally like hit a cat you're probably going to feel worse than like if you step on an anthill so it's like we have like some like echelon of like consciousness but i think the correct way to be would be to like see the face in the anthill or in like those entities that don't necessarily possess or like the earth itself and do a sort of more uh, environmental ethics of it. I think it has room for it. I think he might have just been so preoccupied with the human just because of, and I'm trying not to do this, but I try to like see the biography of the philosopher because it affects their life. So it's like mm -hmm. if you're in a internment camp or a concentration camp, I'm sure like at that point the primacy of like human beings was as big and it's like Jewish people were reduced to not having a face. So I think that was him like trying to give them back the face, so to speak. I think um, it is a question and it, it is a question that we should ask. I spent years as a vegan, as an ethical vegan, because I was like, it's fucked up. 
I still believe it is fucked up. Industrial agriculture is horrific, but it's also, um, it's not a good solution to just go vegan because there's no, no ethical consumption, which is true. There is no ethical consumption. And, um, I also, I think the Janes are badass. The dudes who like walk around with the broom and sweep the bugs out of it. I think that's dope. I think it's all really cool. Um, however, I think we should be careful and we should maintain a sharp delineation. We should celebrate humanness and we should leave the question open. Like, I think octopus are smart as fuck. I think dolphins are smart as fuck. I think dogs are smart as fuck. I project mm. personalities yeah. and emotions and stuff onto my dogs, and my dogs are members of my family. Um, and, like, I, yeah, I think it's good to be, like, a good person to other conscious beings. But I also think it's true that humans have something special our sentience or our sapience mm -hmm. or like whatever it is that that gets called that thing and i don't know i think that's what levinas is getting at with with this metaphysics where he's he's like no the like this infinity is uniquely human um and and that's what's cool about it and because we have this kind of unique capacity it is like our responsibility to not murder animals. Like you shouldn't pick up a squirrel and stab it with a pencil. That's <laughs> fucked up. That's unethical. That's gross. That's psycho psychotic. But also you should always remember that like the other, the proper big other is another human. Um, and you shouldn't let that type of like ethical question of like, well, should we eat meat? get in the way of how to treat other people. So I think, like, I think it's good. I think they're good questions. I think it's a good way to move through the world. Like, if you can be cool, fucking be mm. cool. Because people who suck, fucking suck. Um, but be pragmatic about it, kind of. Yeah, sense. even though I hate that word. That's fuck no, Because I, I hate where that word leads. But yeah, yeah. like, um, like, I don't know, like the people who shop at Whole Foods and they're like, I'm going to buy my vegan fair trade <laughs> whole foods groceries they think they're good people but it's like bitch your pineapple was picked by a slave who was treated horribly your chocolate was picked your chocolate beans or cocoa beans whatever they're called you're picked by slaves they're treated horribly it's the fucking yeah it's but they're anyway. paying for that ignorance though right like moral superiority in a sense right um but no i think it's important to recognize sentience in other sentient beings or consciousness in other conscious beings and to treat them ethically. I also think humans are special. Um, I think that's an interesting question if you're open to the idea of like aliens from other planets. I also mm. think it's super interesting because in maybe a decade or two, we will have synthetic intelligence that that really kind of calls that into question. Have we created a synthetic organism that is a more is, like has the same moral and ethical standing as as humans do? Um, that guy Blake Lemoyne a few years ago, he was a Google developer, Google engineer, and he like went on the news and he's like the google ai is conscious and it has a soul and this and that and he freaked out um and i think it's i think it's absurd i think no it it's not and no the these large language models don't have consciousness but i also think it it's feasible that within a decade we will have kind of created conditions that will allow ethical ethical agents to kind of emerge from the technological substrates. We'll have artificial consciousness, I think, relatively soon. I think. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's, maybe God is real and maybe, you know, the soul isn't something that can emerge, but it's something that has to be imbued by a creator. Maybe that's the case. 
Um, but I, I think I think it's okay to be speciesist. I think it's mm. I think we we all should keep humans up here at the top of the totem pole, but we should also leave room for all the other living things in the world, and we should also include plants. Uh, because plants are also living, and we still don't know the way consciousness works. And maybe we should even include inanimate matter like rocks and dirt, because maybe we don't know, and that stuff can be at the bottom, and then animals, and and then dogs and dolphins and octopi, and then humans. Maybe again, I don't fucking know. I don't it's like thinking about ethics. <laughs> It opens up the question. Like, I just feel like people intuitively already have that kind of paradigm where it's like, if you have to like choose saving a baby from brewing a building or like a bunch of horses in the stable or something, you're going to pick the baby over that. Or people are going to look at you like you're crazy, even though like you may not know the baby, mm -hmm. things like that. So I think it's kind of like intuitive. And that, that's where my issue is. Somebody got mad at me because I did an Instagram post a while ago. It's about everything going on with uh, Gaza. And the guy was like, well, you eat food and you're participating in animal genocide. And like, hell yeah, bitch. I wanted to. And again, and it's like, I get that, but I can't, I can't have my hand in every basket. And it's like, if I have to choose in this moment with my time, energy or my resources to like help human beings who are like being murdered or animals, I'm going to pick children. For sure. And well, just like, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Th there, there are a lot of people, or maybe there seems to be, I don't know, but there seems to be a lot of people who, who use that like superficial ethical position to absolve them of the responsibility to the other. Rather than being a, a good person and trying to act ethically in the world, People can be horrible fucking people. They could treat other people like shit throughout the day. Other people that they actually encounter in real life at the gas station, at work, in their neighborhood, at their kid's soccer game, at the pickleball court. Like, they can be horrible fucking people, but then they can turn around and they can use platforms and, and positions to absolve themselves of that responsibility. And they can be like, I'm, I'm actually a good person doesn't matter that i let the let the face of the other kind of fall on blind eyes because in this fake contrived world i have the right position and i think again going back to why why levinas why now cuz like levinas gives us the ability to to see that and be like well, but you actually suck you, you like you actually you you spit in the face of the stranger. You deny that the child is human. You know? Um, yeah, man. Um, I mean, I just mentioned the non-human creature aspect. Because I think it we're all going to have a different way of approaching how we even just uh, how we consider creatures to be part of our life. Right. And whether or not some people go that whole route of um, enveloping all creatures as maybe being the same um, or uh, probably most of us kind of, pretty much uh, having humans still be uh, most important to us. Um, and then other creatures can play a part in that. Um, but I, I guess I mention it because there's, <laughs> there is this specific Star Trek episode. I'm, I'm trying to remember and I can't, I, f I forgot. Uh, I've been trying to find it um, where it's like this, this thing like uh hijacks like the ship system most of the most of the episode but i think they i think they come to the conclusion like wait a minute 
we're we're all close to exterminating this thing, but I we're starting to realize maybe it has some kind of consciousness. So we let's I think they did like they they let it try to escape it back into outer space because I think it was kind of just lost perhaps within the the circuitry of the of the ship system. Um, is that it's the, the one where that... is that the episode where uh, Wesley is doing an experiment and that's how it starts? Like he he kind of creates the little bugs that hijack the computer and they're destroying the Enterprise. Um, and then O'Brien or Worf, like what, or Riker, maybe somebody shoots the computer trying to destroy them, but they survive. And then eventually they hook up data to them and they're able to communicate with them. And they're like, no, we have a society. We have a civilization. You're killing us. And then at the end of the episode, they escape out into space. That sounds right, but okay. I don't know like what season or like yeah. which episode number. But it's it's the fact that like they slowly come to the conclusion by the end of like, wait, maybe I have to treat this thing with some kind of ethical way of like I'm about to kill it and it's living. It's a living thing that actually has some kind of um direction some kind of like will perhaps um and eventually you know they stop themselves from doing from from killing it uh and i mean that's just a constant i feel like that's just a constant battle that they have to face um i mean it's it's kind of the thing of the prime directive in star trek right don't interfere with the development of other civilizations of other beings um you kind of had to let them take their course. And uh, there's plenty of episodes where like the prime directive is actually uh, ignored and like it's seen as like, but you know, this, this is uh, what needs to happen. So it's, there's like lots of situations where yes, we maintain it, but also there's times where we, we must go Transgress. against it. Uh, <laughs> Transgress. Yeah. And, it's like uh i think that's kind of what i want to drive home with this idea of humans and non-human beings is like yeah it, even if we do consider humans to be um the most important other to try to encounter um if there's a way to encounter other beings maybe in a different way mm -hmm. um to still remain sensitive to that and uh otherwise otherwise we do kind of think like yeah uh you there's plenty of people who could be like yeah humans are really important and also i don't care about where my meat comes from i'll just eat it you know but yeah but it's like ah okay but know that those those things had to kind of be separated right to you yeah. have to create that separation in your ethics in order to continue being so uh cavalier about it whereas yeah. like star trek and sci-fi reminds me oh you know what maybe i had to i do have to like know what i'm doing when i'm approaching any living thing in the world and i have to make my choices in some sense of of how i'm going to react to those living things yeah, I think that's the having having this kind of structural point of view. Um, I I I think that's something that is easy to take for granted. At, at least I, I often take it for granted because um, I forget that not everyone is a Marxist or not everyone has has read Marx. Um. And in fact, most of the people who, who talk about Marxism the most haven't really read Marx. It, it, either the people who think it's evil Satan or the people who think, you know, let's the Internet, we're all communists, let's be radical. Well, perhaps uh, the closest <laughs> lay people get to it, um, unfortunately, is 
uh, when people talk about systemic problems and that ends up going into a question of race, systemic yeah. race. That's but why then you gotta what read immediately, Marx. <laughs> and then immediately what the what people who haven't don't know what that means or are scared of what that means just say, ah, okay, these are just the Marxists and uh, critical race theory is being in, indoctrinating, and it's like, okay, uh, maybe both parties, both like layman terms of th those people are um, not really allowing the the concept of systems mm -hmm. really taking place instead yeah kind of the ideology stuff r yep. just rushes in too fast and then um uh yeah so you, you just have to have a different kind of conversation at that point yeah no that that's that's true and that's um that's why it's important to think about like how do we have conversations about these things with people who haven't read all the same books that we've read and who haven't had these conversations and who haven't had the, the time to study everything we've had the time to study. Um, because yeah, if, if I'm just walking around and say, you need to read Karl Marx and you, you need to this and that, like, yeah, I, my message is not going to get through, but if I take the time and give my audience or give my interlocutor the grace to kind of respect them enough to, to use their language, um, you can actually make a whole lot of headway because like that is a very easy conversation to have with someone. Everything comes from somewhere. It's something that came up uh, on the European tour. Like people just kind of drink wine and don't think about where things come from. Like that was my critique of uh, some of the people we hung out with. Um, they were just kind of PMC, lackadaisical, hotty toddy. I didn't care for them. And I, I said, I was like, oh, they're the type of people who just eat, eat grapes and drink wine and don't think about where things come from. Um, and one of, the, one of the other people there, she's like, yeah, I, like, I worked with these people. And the question came up about like power and electricity and energy. I, I don't know. I don't remember the details of the conversation, but she, like, she was like, these people thought, you know, or the depth of their thought was electricity comes from the plug. They like, they didn't think about all the other implications and consequences of energy production and like climate change and, uh, you know, all the implications of industrial progress. They were just like, yeah, power comes from the wall. Electricity comes from the outlet. Um, and it's very only, only the alien people can see <laughs> yeah, dude. everything, the overmatch. Yeah. Or if it but breaks down. When it breaks down, there we go, Heidegger. Yeah. Um, but it's it's easy, it's easy to facilitate these breakdowns for people. Like, because people have like an innate sense of the process of of things. Um, but if if all you do is just say, I'm a smart, I'm a smart guy. I read Marx and I read Levinas and I read Heidegger and I'm going to use all this fucking hotty toddy philosophy language to show you how smart I am. Of course, people don't give a shit what you have to say. And in fact, you're creating reactionary sentiment because instead of it's having the grace, yeah, instead of having the grace to have a conversation with my neighbor that he can understand, I'm going to sit back and publicly masturbate and say, look how fucking smart I am. And he's going to be like, well, that dude sucks. Whatever he's into. <laughs> I'm against that. Um, and and Levinas, Levinas challenges us to do that. So I'm glad we're reading Levinas. I really am. And I think, by the way, I think that episode is Evolution. It's episode three, season one. I think. Aha. Okay. Let me just type this down. Um, Star Trek movie night, dude. Star Trek every night. I'm saying, <laughs> like, the world would be such a worse off place without were it not for Star Trek, specifically the next generation. But I'll take I'll take any Star Trek I can get. Slap that shit in my veins, dude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't. My brother was watching DS Nine a lot, and I have a feeling that. 
I might actually like it a little bit better than the next generation. Um, <laughs> Them's fighting just words, dude. I feel like um, maybe there's just slightly less filler episodes mm. um, kind of thrown in just to bump up a season, you know? Dude, uh, production-wise, DS9 is a better... It's a better production, better writing, better set design, be better cameras, better everything. DS9 is technically better, but ideologically, like TNG is the height of this naive spiritual communism. I think, this is my theory. I think like the next generation is the future that we were promised that Marx promised us that angles promised not that Marx promised us because Marx was actually but like the next generation is fully automated luxury space communism and that's the ideology of the people who wrote the show and kind of carried the show and then DS9 is like this weird neoliberal wartime like it's it's like wartime communism versus like real communism um ds9 is weird and reactionary and they like justify war and they do a bunch of weird shit so like the next generation some dark episodes yeah dude <laughs> the next generation is like genuine naive communism and then ds9 is like liberal realpolitik like, oh, it would be nice if we could have real communism, but we're in war right now, so we have to do these horrible things, and it's justified. Ah! TNG is kind of Marx and Angles, and DS9 is fucking Trotsky. Like, anyway. But it is a better show. Technically better. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe in future exegeticals, we could also bring up uh, maybe the a really big other in Star Trek is uh, Data, mm -hmm. character of Data, because technically he's an android. Um, android or uh, automaton, perhaps? Uh, we're not sure if he's, if we would say he has anything like a soul, right? He's uh, He's made up of circuitry and stuff. But he is treated there are so many episodes where um it's great because he's the focus of it and we he's kind of like he almost has like this naivety towards humans in the way that like a child does and and but then it, the questions also come up of like well how should we treat data because there's plenty of times where people don't treat him as uh as a person right they don't give him personhood they treat him as a robot, uh, as something very disposable. Um, but there are other, like the human characters uh, will be like, no, but he he matters. He does have personhood. Um, and uh, so, I don't know, just interesting perspectives of how to look at others, right? Dude. I, if we, if we turn reading Levinas into <laughs> just talking about Star Trek, <laughs> I will, I will be so fucking happy because I love Star Trek. And I think, I think all the, all the examples you brought up have, have been spot on. Like, it's not a reach. It's not like we're trying to make this fit into this entertainment property that we're fans of. Like, you're like bringing solid textual arguments. Um, and I think that's, I think that's great. I think I like, fuck it. We might, we might need to write a book. That's just like a Levit, a Levinasian exploration of Star Trek, the next generation. And then we're going to find out we have all these other thinkers we want to bring in. And yeah. then it's just going to, get yeah. unruly very fast yeah they have they have those my buddy just bought uh the legend of zelda and psychology so i mean 
It's not Ooh. a stretch. I That's used to buy when I was like 18, like whatever X Men, not X Men, but X Men and philosophy or whatever in philosophy they'd just come out with. And it would be like philosophy professors talking about, like, let's say Kant in um, The Watchmen. That's where I like first learned about mm-hmm. deontological ethics. So, really? It's not, it's, yeah, it's not the, the biggest stretch in the world. It's, it was a pretty popular uh, series for a while. I don't know if they still make them, though. But it's just insert whatever pop culture. And then it's like literally like 10 essays by random. Like one of, uh, one of my professors in college actually wrote for The Onion and Philosophy one the onion like the satirical news site yeah yep, yep. oh that's fucking yeah, dope so you can go down that rabbit hole i think uh whole big i think that's cool um but i think if theory underground like if yeah. if the theory underground milieu were to do a project like that i think it would be better because i think we go deeper mm-hmm. oh than, yeah no 100 percent yeah. You wouldn't just be like quick buzzwords to make whatever people are for Deadpool and Wolverine and plus we need to get this shit out tomorrow yeah. versus like people who are passionate about it. Like you guys read Dude. Letting Us first and then are like, oh, this fits in. Okay. Well, then I'm going to have to throw some marks in there. So let me reread the Capitol. Yep. What not. So no, I'll, I'm tracking what you're putting out. I'm going to write about the secret of Nim. Oh, that'd be cool. Um, and that is that's old. So that's how long that takes me back. Yeah. There's no. Yeah, it's not like we're like, oh, the de- there's a Deadpool movie in theaters, so we need to get this Deadpool text out. Like, I'm yeah. gonna go back 30 years and write about a fucking cartoon I saw as a kid that haunted me. Hundred percent. So, I th- Thursday night we're gonna meet up for the. Um, discussion session about what we've just read and the next several chapter or sections in the book. I think as it stands right now, um, my main, I guess my main, my main concerns are just kind of getting this idea of metaphysical desire straight. Cause I think I'm still unclear on what that is. If that's, like Cesar, you kind of posited that there's this in innate uh, feature of of being a human where we want to extend, we want to transcend, we want to know the other. And I know Levinas kind of quotes Berkeley, and Berkeley's thing was like the desire to know and to be known, um, the desire to see and to be seen, and. I like I wonder I wonder if it I guess I just wonder if that's going to get fleshed out like that is that metaphysical desire like this drive to to transcend um which is what I'm thinking it is or is it something else I think that's my biggest question Yeah I don't know what my big question will be um I'll just keep reading and honestly it might just be reiterating some of these comments that I wrote in my book and then maybe someone else will have something to say on those comments. That's where I'm at pretty much. I want to like I'm greedy. I want to like take what other people have been picking up from their reading of the text and just see how much it aligns with mine, if it unlocks any new perspectives. Because it's like, I have an idea of what's going on, but I want that humility kind of of like, oh, fuck, I didn't even think of that. And it kind of makes me have to go back and be like, oh, I guess I don't have metaphysical desire down, or I don't have this down, or there's more heart here. So that's what I'm looking forward to the most, the most towards it. So hell yeah, I think it'll be tight. It'll be good. We're time. gonna we're all gonna find out that we're more Heideggerian than we thought. Like <laughs> actually, you guys you guys yeah. focused on the on the Heideggerian stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, we're spiritual <laughs> racists. 
dude. throw out my black notebooks. Yeah, fucking Heidegger, dude. And I think, <laughs> oh, that's actually a question. Um, a question I wanted to ask Christopher. Mm -hmm. Um, so sorry, and I were talking, and so first of all, I don't, I shouldn't be dismissive of Heidegger. Like I know I tend to, uh, say I don't like Heidegger. And that's not fair. Like Heidegger is one of the most important thinkers of the 20th century. Um, and I did enjoy reading Heidegger and, and like continuing to read Heidegger and grappling with, with Heidegger. It's, it's difficult and it's worthwhile and it's something that I encourage everyone to do. Um, but Cesar and I were talking and, and he was like, well, I haven't, I haven't read Being in Time. Uh, I'm not like, I just haven't done it yet. I, I haven't wanted to. And I was like, word. And I was like, well, I don't know. Like, I don't know if there's enough Heidegger in Levinas where you can actually get a good idea. Um, like when he summed up being in time in a sentence, like mm -hmm. I, I am okay with that sum, summation, but also like with the caveat that that's not all there is. Like, there's a whole bunch of other mm -hmm. shit. Like, you cannot totalize being in time in one sentence. But, like, I just wonder, like, I do think that there's probably enough in this book that you can kind of get where he's coming from. But I wonder what you think about that. I think some of it feels like enough because you've been in the the whirlwind of Heidegger for so long. I wouldn't, like, I would spend more time focusing on Levinas, which I'm pretty sure uh, he's doing, than Heidegger. But I think it's enough to get you by. But if you want, like, a full appreciation of what Levinas is bringing to the table or why it's so radical... Then I would say maybe like dip your toes into it a little bit more. But for for what we're doing, like anything Dave had to say in the last lecture and then little snippets from Levinas, I think are enough. Because even in, uh, I can send you a PDF of it, the Levinas uh, Existential Analytic, he has like maybe like 15 pages on Heidegger just summing up being in time. But you don't, I don't think you completely need it. As long as you have some conception of him, which I think you got just from the fucking 10-minute ramble Nance and I were both doing independently, and then from Dave. So I, th I think it's enough to get you by. You're not... You're missing out on, like, almost like Ke Kendrick versus drake like if somebody else explained it to you you're just missing out on like a couple of little like fucking tidbits like oh fuck i didn't know the billy bob brown thing like that's literally all you're missing with this like you have enough to hear the music understand what's going on and enjoy it you're just gonna miss some of that like extra tidbits mm. yeah missing out on some of the some of those details i like that yeah, but, but but you can hear the music too crazy mm -hmm. you can hear the music and you can groove to it so Hell yeah. For sure. All right. I I need a piece out. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, man. It is dinner time. Need to go get dinner You're ready. Insane. Thank you guys. Uh, this was um, great, guys. Thank you. This was great. I feel like this is really good. I'm going to uh upload this tonight. Throw it on the forum. And uh what is today? Tuesday. So yeah, Thursday night we'll be back. Sweet. And, uh, hell yeah. Sounds good. It was nice, uh, virtually meeting you too, Cesar. Yeah, you too. Um, bring some, bring some spicy questions on Thursday. Yeah. I will. All right. Peace out, guys. Peace Thank out, you. Guys.